Ryan Reisard, welcome to the Modern Sales Management Show. I'm fired up to be here. I'm so glad I'm talking to you. You are one of the most prolific teachers on LinkedIn uh, when it comes to sales, sales management, and the you break it down in a unique way. And I want to get into that in just a minute. But start by telling our audience how you got into sales in the first place, and then sales strategy on the level that you're operating today. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so my uh, journey into sales is, uh, is probably like most folks that get into sales, which is wasn't planned. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I come from a, um, like my, my parents are both custodians, uh, master, masters of the custodial, custodial arts, janitors, if you want to be a dick about it, you know, that old joke from Half-Baked. Uh, um, you know, I was the first person in my family to go to college. My brother and sister, you know, multiple times felons, uh, grew up in a pretty rough kind of area. Um, never thought I was going to go to college, but um, while I was growing up, I, uh, I participated in everything, right? And one of the things that really got me through was my teachers, my instructors, and my coaches, and so, um, you know, one of them in particular, uh, really thought I, uh, excelled at math, got me into like, uh, accelerated math early. And, you know, I was blessed with that because, um, it ultimately got me a math scholarship, uh, at Washington State University. And I ended up going to college, um, never thought I would go to college. And so when I was there, I was like, what am I going to do? I got a math, I got a math scholarship. Uh, I guess I'm going to be a math teacher, you know, <laughs> um, and then I'll go be a coach, right? So that's what I was going to do. That's, I didn't really have a plan. I, I wasn't somebody who, you know, knew what I was going to do. I don't think a lot of people do, you know, that's one of those pressures people have uh, when you, when you're not, when you are from a wealthy background, you actually have those pressures. I didn't really have those pressures. I didn't really know what I was going to do. Um, but when I graduated college, uh, I was going back to, to my hometown and I was supposed to do my student teaching that summer. Uh, was 2008, by the way. So fantastic time to graduate. Not, not, not much different than right now, probably for a lot of folks, uh, you know, the last downturn we had. Uh, and I, um, I had a couple of friends in, uh, that, that had internships in San Francisco and, you know, I didn't really travel a lot growing up. So I, I went and visited them um, while I could before student teaching. And when I got to San Francisco, I was literally coming up the escalator out of BART station uh, right downtown. And um, you know, I saw the skyscrapers and all this stuff. I was like, wow, this is amazing. And I saw Porsches driving down the road, like, you know, like a lot of them. And then I saw a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. I can't remember what it was parked, like literally like not, not by a tenant, like at a, like at a meter. I was like, what is this place? And I think I need to be here. Like, you know, the world's burning, the, the economy's, you know, shit show my friends and family are not a good place to be. So I literally sold everything that I own that couldn't fit my parents 86 Toyota when I got back I drove down to San Francisco called the school said I'm not going to student teach and I started looking for work and what do you do in a down economy you know back then you went to Craigslist and looked for who was hiring and everyone seemed to be hiring for salespeople so I decided to get into sales a bunch of interviews finally got a job that's how I stumbled into sales uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know in terms of the strategy component of it you, you know my I had an interesting path, right? That first company I started with, um, they were selling a really interesting home finance product. Again, this is 2008, so I wasn't very smart. I didn't realize, you know, what I was getting myself into, but they're like, hey, we're helping people in this hard time not have to lose their home and so on and so forth. Uh, it was backed by AIG. And uh, so I finally got that job. About eight weeks, I can't remember the exact time timeframe. Um, it was when the government pulled the funding. If you remember all the bailouts, AIG was one of them. And my entire company was laid off overnight. So I went from uh, pretty excited, finally got a job after a long time of searching to shit, what am I going to do? I was running out of money. I don't really have a backup, right? I don't, again, my parents aren't going to help me out. What am I going to do? Um, but within one week from that, from that experience uh, of getting laid off, because my, I had a sales manager who was now a reference for me. I learned CRM, right? I, I learned, I learned a few things. Uh, I got introduced to a recruiter and I had three job offers in, in a week, right? The world's burning around you. And I had three job offers the next week. So that was when I fell in love with sales. Um, you know, and as I've become a student of the game, I realized, you know, folks like Mark Cuban and all these other successful people say like, Hey, if you want to sell, you always have a job. And, um, 
you know, I really fell in love with my background and things like that. Um, the operational side of things, like how to use the systems to be more efficient. And, um, and then I stumbled in that the, the job offer, one of the job offers I had that I took was in paper cook advertising, completely stumbled into it. I thought it was spam at the time. You know, now it's like everyone, you know, is trying to figure this stuff out. But back then, um, it was only like a $15 billion market. Um, and, you know, in the downturn, you had to really be ROI focused, right? CPROI focus is all about the math. And so I really stumbled into the kind of how sales and, and math and, uh, data, all this stuff works together. And I think that's where the strategy and, um, and insight came together. Plus with my kind of problem solving and math background and teaching background is kind of where I, where I think I got to where I'm in today. So did you immediately connect sales with your math background? Uh, was it taught to you by a mentor or did you put it together yourself? Uh, and was there a gap there when, when, like, was it an, a light bulb moment? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I certainly didn't put two and two together. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 22 years old or whatever the heck I was, you know, didn't know what the hell I was doing, uh, trying to figure stuff out. And um, I sucked really, really bad um, in the beginning stage. Like I was having success. And, you know, one of the things that I still do today that most people won't do is like, even if I don't know what I'm doing, I'll just pick up the phone and call somebody, you know? So like, I'm not afraid to go and do the activity and, you know, a blind squirrel gets a nut every, you know, every now, now and again, it's the old saying or whatever. So, you know, brute force has been um, a good trait for me because, you know, you know, I'll get, I'll figure it out. But, um, you know, I was doing a lot more than anyone else and, and, and just, you know, kind of hit my, hit my metrics. And at some point um, uh, I was struggling a bit because I was having a lot of calls. I was having, you know, a lot of uh, you know, leading, leading the leaderboard, if you will, on activities, but my conversion just was terrible. And, um, and eventually something clicked for me. And this is where the bucketing system came in. Whereas like, instead of me, like just showing up, having a list of leads and a lead list or whatever, and calling down the list, you know, I found that like those who picked up the phone tend to pick up the phone again. And I also found that like, when you call someone back, even if they tell you not to call back, they don't remember you. And so like, uh, if I can have more conversations with the right types of people when I know the accounts of fit, well, I want to optimize for conversations because that's kind of where, you know, where the money's made. And so, you know, I started to realize that you can, you can bucket your, your data in a way where you can maximize your, your effort to outcomes. Right. And then what I also learned is, you know, there's a lot of things that you do with the activities along the way that can help you be faster the next time, right? So this is way before the age of a lot of auto dialers and things like that. And again, 2008, 2009, not, not a lot of investment in sales acceleration software, right? Didn't really even exist. I uh, remember Yesware came out in like 2010 or something. That was like a game changer. I could see that you open an email and follow up with it. But we're talking about like jigsaw for research, not a lot of LinkedIn back then. You know, I'm, I'm calling companies, not even knowing who to talk to. And my first call is, who manages your paid search? And they didn't even know what that was. Like, you know, that was like the first step, step of the process. So you got to document the path along the way. Your CRM is your best friend. And little things like, you know, if somebody programs their name in their voicemail, they have a better chance of, pick, of actually picking up the phone than if they don't, right? Um, and if, if I call a number and it's not a direct dial, but uh, I wait forever to press eight and then three, four, seven and pound. I should actually document that information because the next time, instead of me listening through, I could press eight. It'll skip all that. I could press three, four, seven pound. And now I've got a direct dial basically, right? And if I have that plus a recorded voicemail, I've got a number that's has a better chance of picking up. So I just kind of picked this stuff up all along the way. And, um, you know, at one point I, I, I started... I moved from being a rep to managing a, the inside sales team. I got promoted like everyone does when you start having success. And uh, I remember one day I just started drawing, Hey, like the goal is you got this big bucket and you're just trying to move people through these buckets. And, you know, you just have, that's where buckets emerge. Right. And that was a long time ago, but um, it just took time to put that stuff together. And then the final piece with the math of sales was, Hey, it's a numbers game. Everyone says it's a numbers game, but like, let's just do the math and you know, know your, everyone says, know your ratios, but let's just do the math, right? If we need one meeting, you know, how many, how many of those meetings actually show up? 
well, if we need meeting, one meeting a show, we need to book two if it's 50% show rate or whatever, right? And you just kind of start reverse engineering it. And that was kind of the, the, the start of math of sales. And it's evolved a long way. But those are the two things I focus on, you know, buckets, being as efficient as possible, focus on outcome, the thing closest to outcomes first, whether it's revenue or a meeting or a conversation, and then math of sales. So what do I need to do to get there? And it almost seems simple. Really evolved. I mean, the concept almost seems simple. The exec, you know, it's all in the execution. Uh, what do people, when you first explain those two concepts, especially the math of sales, because it's something that you're really known for, what do people, uh, what are their reactions when you try to explain it to them? Um, do they feel, oh, I, I know this, I've been doing this forever when they really haven't? Or uh, what's the hardest part about getting people to understand it? Yeah, it's a great question, right? So so I think it, there's two camps. A lot of people when you're like, oh yeah, 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 I know that, right? I know I know my metrics, I know my metrics. But if you start to ask them the questions, they don't they don't really know it. The, the, like if you ask them what their close rate is on the opportunities, like, well, it depends. Like, well, no, it doesn't depend. How many opportunities do you have? How much you close? It's a rate. What is it? Right? Your math of sales is your math of sales. So what is it? Well, well, this no, no. What is it right now? Just put it, put it down, right? And so, like, you start to uncover that. And and so, people who think they know, they don't really know, or they're not really dissecting it. And you know, even myself, I preach it all the time. Sometimes I I don't go back to it. You know, I'm not I'm not I'm not methodical about this sometimes. And and you have to get back on track, right? So even if you know it, you're not really usually using it the way you should, especially when you're successful. If you're having success, you stop going back to that that basic thing that drives your success because, you know, things are going well. Why do I need to worry about optimizing? Right. You know, so that's when you, that's when that happens. Mm -hmm. Even a little bit of success can, can put you, you know, lull you into that. Oh yeah. I mean, it's like, Hey, like, uh, you know, math of sales tells me I need to have seven completions a day. Now that's a new, the new term I call completions it used to be conversations, but I love this completions thing. I need seven completions a day. Uh, but you know, I just closed two deals. So, if, you know, fuck calling today. Right. Like, right, you know, right. and that's going to put me off. It will put me off. And if I do that multiple times over a week, my month's off. If I do that uh, a couple times a month, my quarter's off. And, and you know, those things when you know those things, but, but you don't until you're, you're feeling the pain, right? You go back, oh shit, mm -hmm. that's right. You know, go back to the fundamentals. So that's that camp. The other camp falls into what you, you said, Hey, it sounds so simple. Like the way you just explained it. Why didn't I think about that? Like, and then they kind of, start using it. So it's not so much that it's difficult to understand. It, it's, it's actually really simple. Um, there's a couple ratios you need to cover. And, and once you, un like when you, when you're like, not when your ego gets out of your way, like, yeah, actually it makes a lot of sense. If I, if I need to build pipeline, I just kind of take it one bite at a time and you can take a big ass number and turn it into a small one. That's actually doable. If you just start doing the work today. So it's not a lack of understanding. It's not a lack of wanting to operate their sales team that way. Do you think it, um, where people struggle with this is, it goes back to execution, confidence in their data to begin with. They don't have a track record to be able to say this many completions or conversations resulted in this because no, everyone's used, tracking differently and not using a consistent lead management framework. Yeah, let's get back to it, right? People start to think about this when they're not having success. So when you're not having success, you're looking for silver bullets. How do I get a quick win tomorrow? And then they realize that, well, this all makes sense. Like, how do I get a quick win tomorrow? Like, well, no, you, you know, your math of sales is your math of sales. And if you don't have metrics, you got to go get the metrics. And if you don't know where to start, you just got to do it. Here's a benchmark. Like if you're too far off, then go make some adjustments that so don't, don't make any adjustments until you've had, you know, square root of TAM worth of conversations. So if you have 10,000 potential customers, there's a hundred conversations before you make adjustments. And if you're, you know, you're not well enabled, you haven't done a good job building good lists. You don't follow the system. Getting to a hundred conversations, is a lot of fucking work. But, so, yeah. you know, you, you build a list, most of the data and any data you buy, you're not going to get great data. It's going to be shit. You have to go through the process, document the path. Through, and over time, if you do 10 a day, you know, you can get to a hundred in a quarter, no problem. You can get a hundred in a month sometimes if you're working in a market where the, you know, you can get data quickly, but you just have to start biting it off one at a time. And so where people fail is because they're already failing and they are looking for a quick win. 
And so everyone, and then by the way, that is why they, uh, they don't get started in the first place, even when they're getting started, because, you know, they're looking for the quick win. I'm excited in this new company. I've got this new, you know, you know, I got this new role. I got all these things I'm supposed to be doing, but I forget that I have to start building my list. The list is my strategy. And if I don't start building that list now, it's going to bite me in the ass tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So Who gets more it's just excited? a lot. Who gets more excited about the math of sales when, when you talk about it? the uh, sales reps or sales management team? I think reps really appreciate the math of sales more than management in a lot of cases because management, management, they never want to own those metrics. They always want to be in a position where they're like, well, it depends. We don't know. I don't, you know, it varies. It's all of that stuff you hear. No, it doesn't. Your math of sales, your math of sales, put the numbers in and optimize around it. It's going to tell you who are you targeting? Like, are you targeting the right people? Are you saying the right things? And are you, you know, other areas for optimization? Well, I mean, what about this? What about that? Great. That's all a part of the process, right? You can expect that if you do these things, something like that might happen. You don't know, but averages, a lot of averages, a lot of numbers will work out over time. That's the whole point of this thing. Um, so management always wants to have excuses and they always want to blame something else. And they always want to say, well, it depends. And I, I, I don't know. It's like, it's, you know, let the reps deal with it. Right. Um, especially around the list, by the way, which is, which is a fundamental problem here. Right. Uh, fundamental has, problem. What do you mean? I still haven't been a part of an organization that is doing a great job of saying, Hey rep, these are the exact people I want you to go talk to. They might define a territory. Hey, you know, companies that look like this in this patch, that's the directionally Okay. But not great. Um, and they might, they might do the name to count things. They now the new hot thing is account based, right? Account based. They might do that, but even that's like, um, you know, there's still like these different tiers and there's no focus there. They're not really saying, Hey, I want these customers, right? I want right. these customers. I want these customers. They leave it to the reps. Um, and when you do that, then you start to get into conflicts, right? If you have specialization, you go, Hey, go get me meetings. I'm getting you meetings. All those meetings aren't qualified. What do you mean? You know, they're in this industry and it's this title. Yeah. But it's like, you know, you know, what solves all that problem is go get me meetings with Josh go get me a meeting, like, give me the damn list. And then I'll right. tell you, and then I'll tell you, you know, no one does that. Why? Why? It was the same problem we're saying. Like, they don't want to own it. Like, well, yeah. well, we don't know. We, we don't know. It's like, great. We'll draw a line in the stand and test it. Come up with a couple of different ones, right? Let's see, is Josh worth our time or not? But then you solve all those problems around, is the meeting qualified? As an SDR, if you have specialization, I don't give a shit if the meeting's qualified. I got you the meeting. That's my job, right? Like you told me, <laughs> my job is to get a meeting. I can't really do much. The buyer process, if I'm doing all this qualification, you're just pissing them off. Does this, want... How does this fit into the, in, an organization's growth plan if you don't often have accountability at the management level? Are there ways to institutionalize the math of sales in an organization? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, it has to start at the top, you know, you can't, you can't, it doesn't work if, if it's not stop. There's always conflict, right? If you get, I get a lot of reps that when you ask the question about excitement, a lot of reps get excited about this because now they're like, oh, wow, it's so clear. If I want to make my goal, you know, I have to have X number of, you know, completions of conversations every day and those ought to work out. Right. And as long as they're with the right people and I'm saying the right things, and if they're not, I can actually make adjustments like, Hey, I'm not getting the conversion I need. Am I targeting the right people? Am I saying the right thing? How do I learn from it? It's, it's like a very simple framework. So people get excited about it, but where they get frustrated is then you start to realize the most important thing in the math of sales is target, target message channel timing. But if I don't have a clearly defined target, all the other things go to waste. And if you start asking around organizations that don't believe in this, there's no clarity. It's like, Hey, who are our best customers? Why are they our best customers? What was their problem before they even knew who we were, right? Why was it so painful? They decided that they wanted to talk to us and buy from us. And then why do they continue to buy from us? No one wants to answer those questions. They just want to say, Go, we have the best products and sliced bread. Go find people, right? So, so if I'm a CEO listening to this, this interview right now, and I am tracking with you, I'm excited about what you're saying. I want to bring this to, to my organization. 
uh, you know, I may get buy-in, I may get pushback. What are, what are some concrete steps that I can take um, or have my team take to systematize this so that my team of 20 sales reps um, can start leveraging this? So the, 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 I mean, the first thing is, is, you know, so there's two questions you have to answer, right? Where do my, where do my customers spend their time? Right. And how much can I afford? How much can I afford to reach them? If you can't answer those questions, then it's hard for you to get to math of sales, but that means you don't have math of sales, right? So you go, okay, if I can answer those questions, then great. Like my, my customers spend their time on LinkedIn or email or whatever. So if they spend their time there, then I can go and look at how many activities it take to get a conversation, how many conversations I can start to do that. Right. Um, but if I can't answer that question, then it's like, all right, we're in testing phase. The other thing is how much can I afford to pay them? Well, what's your revenue target? What's your average customer value? What do you pay your reps if you're spending money? Like, so you can get to CAC, right? And most people can't answer that question either. So like, they just can't, they can't answer that. So you have to answer that first. Um, and that's going to help drive, you know, the basic math of sales, which is like how many, you know, completions now, you know, whatever, I just conversations. It doesn't really matter how many act, act how many actions that lead to me and you across the table from one another does it take for me to get to a sale? Um, and if I can't answer that question, that's where you start. Um, and that becomes your, your, uh, your benchmark. And then from there you'd say, okay, well now I know this and they're probably going to say, holy shit, we're spending way too much money, you know, for acquiring meetings, opportunities, all that stuff. So now you can start saying, well, if that's too much, Go back to the other question. Well, where are our customers spending their time? If we're spending all of our time, you know, trying to uh, get them on the phone, which is the most expensive, like cold calling is the most expensive thing to do, right? Always. Like, it's mm -hmm. high cost professional people. If that's too expensive, are there other ways we can drive them into our funnel? You know, could we do ads? Could we do SEO? Could we do podcasts? Could we do, you know, events? Uh, whatever it is. Like, how do we go and get that list? And then how do we start to activate that list? And, um, you know, that's going to be the whole framework there, but everyone's math of sales is their math of sales. So you have to have that basic fundamental knowledge of um, what is our current state, right? And then what is, from our current state, is this working or not? It's always, you can always optimize, you always get better. So once you have that, you can start to implement and get super efficient. You can start to figure out what technologies you can implement, you know, what types of people you should hire, what type of specialization you could potentially bring into your funnel. But until you have that basic understanding, um, you know, you won't be able to build this, right? Did you ever get kicked out of people's offices where like you, you're teaching and preaching and they, they're like, okay, I, I get this, but honestly, this is too big a lift for my company to, to implement. We're just going to go, you know, hope and pray some more. Uh, well, I mean, I, I haven't been kicked out of an office, but I mean, I certainly have people that don't believe in it. There's a, there's a very, there's a very um, popular guy uh, on LinkedIn who I think I've blocked since uh, for a while. I tend to block people after a while that was, that, that does some videos. That's like math of sales is bullshit, you know? So I'm assuming he's talking about me because I always talk about math of sales, but I don't know. Math of sales is bullshit. It's all like, you know, you know, you can't, you can't predict you can't predict what's going to happen. And it's the same person that also thinks that managing towards activities and things like that is, is, is stupid. Well, it is if you have the wrong activity metric. It isn't if you have your math of sales because your math of sales never lies. So right. there are people like that that exist 100% because they think it's all relational, but we don't sell that way. We don't, oh, we don't do that. It's all referrals based. Well, if it's referrals based, you still have math of sales. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. How, how many referrals do you need to get a sale? Like you just reverse it, right? It's a channel. So um, absolutely people don't believe in it. Um, and it, you know, uh, this isn't, this isn't rocket science. So there's a lot of other people that are like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We got that. Right. Like I said earlier, like, oh, we got that, but they don't. And so they, there's a lot of waste in that yep. um, in their funnel. So for me, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big believer in trying to eliminate hundred percent of the waste. So companies can be as efficient as possible uh, to drive revenue um, so that they have the capital they need to survive and hopefully thrive because most people don't know a lot of this stuff. So you have to have as much cash as possible to do a lot of testing. But if you go and hire a bunch of people that don't believe in this, 
you're not doing a lot of testing. You just, you're just doing what doesn't work. Right. You know, right. double sales, double head count. Like, that doesn't work for most people. 90, 88, 90% of companies fail. It's probably not because, you know, I mean, it's a lot of cases, the products and services suck, but you know, whatever. Let's assume you got to some sort of level of traction. You're failing because you're not giving yourself a long enough time in a market to, you know, find and nail your niche. And you're, and you're not finding a nail in your niche and growing, you know, the way you need to, because you don't know your math of sales. The math of sales never lies. It, it's complicated. It, it's not easy. I think you, you did uh, be the first to admit that, but getting it right is imperative. There's no other way uh, to do it. Once somebody starts basing their decisions uh, on the math of sales, uh, are there common pitfalls that people run into that you can uh, highlight for us so that maybe some folks listening to this will avoid? Yeah, the, the biggest one is time, right? So we're solving, we're solving an equation, target message channel timing. And so they're not giving it enough time because they think that it's, you know, when you're building a, a go to market engine, um, especially an outbound engine, if it's not, you know, people raising their hands because you're not, you know, you're still trying to search for this stuff. Everybody is, is thinking, if I get you across the table, if you don't buy from me right now, that's a failure. But what they don't realize is that over time, so long as you're doing a good job with selection and it is the right person, that person might be your customer. Um, you know, and, and I, I, uh, I've been in my swim lane for long enough to know that like today, I get a ton of leads. I have, I have customers that continue to, in fact, I have a meeting on Friday with somebody who's going to be my third, third time with me, right? He's been a CEO at three different companies. And every time he goes to a new role and he literally told his team, Hey, I brought in Ryan. You guys didn't even know I was going to bring in Ryan. The reason I brought in Ryan is because he understands this stuff. And the thing about Ryan is if he doesn't know someone or if he can't solve our problem, he knows someone who can, um, but he, it's a specific niche, right? It's top of funnel, go to market. This is the guy you go to, but it's taken me six, seven years or so of just kind of just hammering this same thing. And, you know, a couple different companies that have built around this, but it's timing. Now I've been going through a couple different companies, but I'm sticking to the same problem. I'm sticking to the same problem, saying the same message. And only now am I starting to see some exponential. It's easier now, you know, five, six years down the road than it was when I began. If I start to, if I give up on the problem too quickly, I won't see the impact of this stuff, right? It's a model. Math of sales is a model. It's not perfect. Mm -hmm. it, and, and so timing is the biggest thing that kills everyone. Cause they're like, well, we've got all these conversations. They're coming in meetings, but nothing's closing. Well, that's something you can learn from the model one. You know, you get timing is always a problem, but two, like, well, what can we, what can we do to also start to take advantage of all those conversations? Are you asking for referrals? All those other things that come into play, but so many organizations think about lead generation in the, the lens of, if I'm talking to you, you need to buy now versus, Hey, uh, and, and I learned this from, uh, uh, Raji as the CEO at founder CEO at sprinkler, which is a company that, uh, acquired, I was head of sales at a company that was acquired by them. And he said, he preaches it from the beginning. We go to the onboarding and all that stuff as a company. He's like, Hey, look, we have 10,000 customers, you know, 9,000 don't know yet. Right. And he just preaches that all the time. Like we, he knows exactly who he wants to sell to. Mm -hmm. And he's on a mission to go bring them all in over time. And he gets that. He's just moving the, the ball down the field, moving the ball down the field. And that's, that's true enterprise software sales. He gets that it's long sales cycles. But most people don't get that, even if they're selling a freaking can of soda, right? I mean, you just keep hammering that message, keep hammering the process. And yes, you can make some tweaks, but you got to give it time. That's the biggest downfall is people are always looking for that silver bullet, right? And I think a big part of that is because, again, if things are going well, you don't think about these things. So yeah. if, if you start this from the beginning and you subscribe to it from the beginning and you think that from the beginning, this is going to turn your business over tomorrow, you know, it's not, right? You got to look. 24, 36 months out. And as you look back on it, you now have, you've reverse engineered that. You now understand what happened. You have a, a methodology for testing and, and, and actually uh, making informed decisions. You're not wasting money in the wrong areas too quickly. And, um, um, but, but that, that timing thing is the biggest piece. It's just, they don't give it enough time and, and they don't know how to actually 
you know, run a relationship based sales process, right. You know, every, everything's transactional and about me, me, me versus you've got to be much more open and collaborative and, and really subscribe to the, the market of the problem, not just the problem itself. Right. No, that, that makes Build a lot channel of, relationships, lot of all that stuff. That, that makes a lot of sense. I, I think of so many companies and we talked about this in, in kind of our, our prep call for this conversation is just, uh, it's not as prevalent. This kind of thinking is not as prevalent as it should be. There's so many companies who at the executive level say, all right, we have non-sales, you know, people who are not customers and people who are customers. Why, why make this <laughs> move them from one side to the other? Um, and they're quick to make assumptions. It's because the leads aren't good. It's because marketing is not doing their job. It's because our sales team need, you know, isn't good. Um, and the math of sales, when you break it down, tells you exactly where, where to focus. And it also tells you where not to focus, you know, coming from the inbound world. Um, a lot of times we'd get heat for, you know, the leads are not good. Well, actually, and if you break it down, I mean, this is, this is broader, but also not as granular as the, the math that you work with. You can say, well, actually, they're getting stuck at this point in the process. Let's get creative about where, uh, oh, you know, two out of four of, of your sales reps are not following up with leads for five days. Like, let's address that. That's a training or a coaching or a personnel issue, not a the leads are not good issue. What, why isn't this more prevalent? <laughs> You're spot on. I mean, it's a process, right? Uh and when you have a process, you can identify problems in the process and fix them. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't, I mean, you're just throwing spaghetti against the wall. And it can be uh, very expensive to make decisions not on the math. Like that's the pitch for the math of sales. It's not for the math of sales. It's like, you're going to waste a lot of money if you don't have this structure set up because you're going to fix things that aren't broken and you're going to let things linger that are draining revenue from your company. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an age old constraint analysis, right? Like focus on the things that are um, most important, you know, yeah. and, and uh, a lot of times we focus on solving the wrong problems. And when it comes to the top of funnel, there's just, there's just so much crap and noise and there's no process. It's all, you know, give me a lead. Like, well, what's right. a lead, you know? Yeah, it's true. It's true. Where's so. this going to be? How much does the math of sales? I want to wrap up with with this question. Uh, how much does the math of sales evolve over time? If I'm a a chief revenue officer, VP of sales, CEO, where should I be looking two years from now uh, to be um, to make sure that I'm in the right place to run my business this way? Yeah. So, so the, the idea is like, again, it's a, it's, it's, it's a model. So whenever you're doing the math of sales, you're, you're reverse engineering it from the baseline of in my, from all the data I have right now, right. How many, how much effort does it take for me to get one deal? And then once I understand that I'm benchmark. So if I'm going two years out, I say, so it's two years from now, I want to get to 10 million and my average and I want my average value, by the way, it doesn't have to be the average value. Say so I want my average value of the customer to be 50,000, right? So whatever that is, X deals, um, then you just reverse engineer from close rate to show uh, accepted rate. And show, it's all the way up through the funnel. Once you have the model in place, you want to be, you, you want to be on that thing minimum, at least once a month to just kind of backfill how we're looking from the top of the funnel. You're not going to see the lower funnel stuff yet until you start getting through your sales cycle. But once you start getting deals in, start plugging in those numbers and Hey, are we way off? Do we need to make adjustments um, in terms of more or less? Right. Or uh, uh, are we on and we're good? Or are we, are we, are we off in a good way where, Holy cow, this is a good thing. Let's scale this bad boy up. Let's crank it. Right. Let's start to throw fuel on the fire. We've nailed it. Right. Mm -hmm. how, often you you, do you, how often do you need to make those adjustments or, or when do you have enough data to be able to, to make those adjustments to your assumptions. So, so I believe in, we were, we wrote this ebook, Chris Beal, uh, Rex and I wrote an ebook called the math of sales market dominant market domination. It's a, I can send a copy if you want. We'll, we'll uh, link it from uh, the show notes too. 
uh, so it's an ebook, uh, and I just recently got it on uh, Kindle too. So there's more distribution on this thing. But um, the idea is uh, that there's an old sampling model, right? So like manufacturing, whatever. If you want to look at the sample of a, a batch, right? Quality assurance and stuff like that. You use the square root of of the the, the units of the batch size, right? So. So we talk about using the square root of the the list, the total addressable market, right? So for whatever hypothesis you have, and again, you can you're going to have different industries, different verticals that you might be going after. You're going to have different math for each of those. Before you start to make adjustments, you should use the square root of that addressable market. So in in software, you want to be a hundred million dollar company, you know, ten thousand dollar a month uh, customer, uh, you know, you get you get uh, so ten thousand to ten thousand is a hundred million dollar company. So square root of 10,000 is a hundred. So go talk to a hundred people, go talk, go get completions, get real, like run a hundred people through the process. And you probably have a positive signal. If you want to, if you're testing messaging, so that's all the way through, right? Mm -hmm. You want to talk, you want to talk about messaging at the very top of it, talk to like, what's the first, what's the first unit of conversion? Square root of TAM is a good estimate. So a hundred, a hundred is a good estimate in most cases, right? If you really want to be simple with it, mm-hmm. but you know, just take the square root of your list and say, all right, that's probably a good sample size before I start tweaking too much. Now there's little things that you just know that you might want to adjust. Like, oh, that word sounds off. It'd probably be better if I said this now that I'm using it, but you don't want to start making big list chains and big messaging changes, especially on your marketing site that has to match all that stuff. Otherwise it's all right. going to go to shit, but you'll learn that. <laughs> hey, we're getting a bunch of meetings. No one's showing. Hmm. We're saying this, and then our website says this, and the you know the reviews online say that. You know now you can learn and make adjustments. But um, but that's a good sampling of of where you know you can kind of benchmark around. You should make too many adjustments. Um, and then again, give it enough time, right? Uh, so you know if you're if 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 everyone likes to say their sales cycle is 90 days and you ask, you, you ask a sales person, you know, sales leader, <laughs> CEO, Hey, what's your sales cycle? That's ah, 90 days, right? Everyone's going to say that it's not right. But, uh, you know, give it enough time, um, and enough quant- quantity before you make too many adjustments. Um, some of it's art, but the objectivity will help drive that, uh, using the math of sales. Right. I really appreciate the, this conversation. The, uh, I mean, it was paradigm shifting and actionable at the same time. So where can people connect with you online or learn more about what you teach? Yeah. Uh, so, so Matt, uh, my main channel is LinkedIn um, right now. And then I just launched a little Patreon group uh, a couple of weeks ago with the idea that we'll meet up once a week, talk about all this stuff. I've got a bunch of resources um, in there. You can come learn your math of sales. Uh, I've got a course on buckets. Um, and you get a bunch of access to other free stuff like the audio book and things like that of uh, Outbound Sales No Fluff. Um, so those two areas are where I'm spending my time on the teaching side. And then I, I um, also started live streaming cold calls um, um, on LinkedIn and Twitch. Actually, YouTube, a couple of different channels now. It's all streamed through the same thing. And that's every day. So if you want to pop in on my live streams between connects, uh, I talk about this stuff every day. You know, I, I was on one this morning. It's, it's really valuable stuff and nobody else is, is doing this, uh, that, that I've seen. So, uh, is there any last, uh, before we wrap up any last bit of sales management advice that you want to make sure our audience is aware of? Ah, uh, sales management. Yeah. I mean, look, process, Sean Cease will love me for this one process before technology, before people, right? build the damn process, run it, prove it, then bring in technologies that are going to amplify, you know, one to many before you, and then bring in the people. Um, You know, that's the, that's the, that's the age old uh, principle. And then it's a circle. It's continuous, right? People then will come in and drive it and build the process, make it better, but process technology, people nail it before you scale it for management. Ryan Ryan Reiser. I really appreciate this conversation. It was enlightening. And uh, most of all, I enjoyed this, uh, this talk. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And that does it for this episode of the Modern Sales Management Podcast. Have a great day. 